Good morning, everyone. Okay. I think some of you might have seen already the e-poster just in the, in the pre uh, previous session, but uh, I'm here also to talk you through uh, Evoland. So uh, indeed, my name is Ruby van der Kerkhove. I work at uh, V2 Remote Sensing, but I'm also the project manager of the Evoland project. So it's my, my honor to present that today. So actually, sorry, what is Evoland? Um, Evoland is a Horizon Europe project. Uh, as, you, as you might know, uh, the CLMS, the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, it's about operations. Evoland is Horizon Europe, that uh, project that actually tries to support uh, the CLMS yeah, by enhancing its quality and also efficiency. It's a three-year project. We started in, in January of this year. And uh, so yeah, first results start to kick in. It's, it's getting more and more interesting. So Evoland tries to develop new product chains, uh, new prototypes working on uh, method development, and the goal is to preserve the continuity of the, the CLMS, but however, to keep it also modern and attractive. And as such, provide tangible uh, output uh, to support the interested entities being GRC and EEA to respond to European policy needs. So, just going fast. Okay. To achieve these objectives, we have brought together a unique consortium coordinated by Vita Remote Sensing of uh, different partners, uh, experienced service providers. We have uh, leading research institutes, but also partners experienced in, uh, in suited data collection, um, also novel EU data, uh, cloud infrastructure, as well as user eng engagement to ensure a successful implementation of, of the project and also the prototypes. So as I said, Evoland, it's about increasing the quality, timeliness, and efficiency of the CLMS. So we will develop 11 prototypes or algorithms and processing chains for 11 candidate CLMS services. And therefore we will first start by assessing the requirements for each of these prototypes. Actually, this work is already has, has been done. So we have already written quite some reports on that. So we, we're, we're gathering the user and policy requirements for the prototypes, but also what are the data requirements and the infrastructure requirements. Towards the end of the project, we also will do a full analysis of the operational readiness of these prototypes. And this, of course, will be in close uh, collaboration with our main stakeholders being the Copernicus and trusted entities, but also other Copernicus uh, land users. So regarding methods, um, Evoland will work on uh, innovative method development. We, we are in embedding state-of-the-art AI techniques, working on biomass mapping, uh, continuous monitoring, data fusion, but also integrating uh, novel EU data, novel in situ data, and novel, uh, no, and everything will be done in an uh, in an open source way. Um, so all the algorithms will be made open source with particular focus on the OpenAO framework. As an example regarding AI, what we will do, uh, working on state of the art weekly supervised learning foundation models. Um, the super resolution techniques. So uh, a lot, a lot of things are happening. Regarding pro, sorry, it's going fast. It's sensitive. Uh, regarding prototypes, we are working on, like I said, eleven prototypes across different thematic domains: uh, water, urban, agriculture, forestry. Um, and if you if you want to know more on each of these prototypes, actually, you can consult our website where you find more details. Uh, describing what's actually the goal, the objective of, of the prototype and how it improves uh, the, what's currently there already in the CLMS. As an example of such a, a prototype, we're working on improved water mapping. Um, so we're we are integrating AI techniques like super resolution, but also novel earth observation data like the SWOT altimeter, to improve, for instance, the uh, to to improve like the the the, the water map. So methods uh, and algorithms will be demonstrated and assessed over a number of test sites located both within and outside Europe. So we're not going to make continental uh, or or global data sets yet. It's uh, we're we're focusing on a number of uh, test sites, but scattered across different biomes. Uh, so that at least we can assess what are the 
let's say the the capabilities of the prototypes to be upscale to to continental or global scale. So sorry, I only prepared for a short presentation. Uh, so ten minutes, it's, we're not there yet. But if you want, uh, I could talk a bit longer, but haven't the slides yet for that. So. Uh, if you want to be part of Evoland, uh, please subscribe to our social media channels. Uh, have a look to our website where you will find more news. There's also the possibility to subscribe to a newsletter there or just uh, contact me during one of the coffee breaks. Thank you. We take questions now or? Okay. Yeah. In the middle of some time, the decided the perfect unboxing, please. Try out the presentation. Good morning. I'm Paolo Mazzetti from National Research Council of Italy. You can see my slides. Thank you. And I'm the project coordinator of this new life for drylands project. Just waiting for the <laughs> first slide. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the presentation is on using earth observation for the assessment of nature-based solution effectiveness to combat land degradation. And the project is a live preparatory project on remote sensing oriented nature based solution towards a new life for drylands. And uh, basically, the objective of the project is to pro provide some means to support decision makers with remote sensing techniques for the design of nature based solution and for monitoring the effectiveness of these solutions. So uh, we have uh, four major activities. The first one was uh, actually to characterize the drivers of uh, land degradation. The second one was the, the definition of a set of indicators and indices that could be used for degradation estimation and based on remote sensing techniques. Then we are developing a modeling tool, which is a sort of knowledge base linking drivers with potential nature based solutions and remote sensing indicators. And the final outcome will be a new life for drylands protocol. We call it is a set of good practices for decision makers to adopt remote sensing for designing nature based solution and for uh, the, the assessment. We have uh, some case studies, uh, two in Spain, two in Greece, and two in Italy. And the outcomes will be, of course, the monitoring model and the assessment protocol. We are in the last uh, uh, eight months of the project, so we are in the last phases. So we uh, will deliver the first draft of the protocol, and we plan to have uh, uh, consultations with local stakeholders to get feedback. A few uh, details on uh, the sorry the technical activities concerning the remote sensing indicators. Uh, we have some challenges. One is that we work it on local scale. We were talking about uh, national parks, protected areas, and so on. So in these cases, some free uh, available products like Copernicus Service could be not fully reliable. So we had to consider also different. Uh, uh, approaches, uh, taking into account the, 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 the real context. And uh, we had also some constraint. Being a life project, we were not tasked with uh, research, so we had to adopt well-known remote sensing indicators and spectral indices. And we, in particular, worked on declining on a local scale the, 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 the calculation of the SDG 15.3.1 indicators on land degradation neutrality. And of course, uh, another let's say, constraint was the, to use free available open satellite data as much as possible. Concerning the, the model, uh, as said, it's a sort of knowledge tool uh, linking external pressures, degradation processes, potential nature-based solution, and uh, indicators uh, derived by remote sensing that could be used for that. 
<clears throat> we are uh, developing in particular a web tool for consultation by decision makers. And this will be part of the, sorry. Oops. Very, <laughs> very sensitive. Uh, the, the, the part of the new life for drylands uh, protocol, which is a set uh, of operational standards for preparing drylands restoration plans, so for the design, but also for the continuous monitoring of the effectiveness of the adopted solutions. And as said, we uh, are delivering the first draft uh, for consultation with the local stakeholders in Greece, Spain, and uh, Italy. Next actions, in particular concerning the, the, the geo context, uh, the idea would be to work on addressing uh, multi scale issues on uh, particular land degradation and land degradation neutrality. So, from local to national to regional level and, of course, to global. We would like to do this through the Eurogeo land cover land use action group at the European level and uh, through the activities in the relevant uh, initiatives and flagship in GEO at the global level, like uh, the GEO LDN or GEO Earth Observation for Ecosystem Assessment and, uh, and so on. Thank you. You can find more info on uh, the project website, and this is the QR code also for this. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, before we wait for the slides, so my name is Gregory Giuliani. I'm working at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, and uh, I'm sharing my time, as you probably know, with the United Nations Environment Program, the Global Resource Information Database. And in that frame, I would like to, in the next couple of minutes, just, just to show you uh, the initial work we're doing to improve land cover mapping in Switzerland and to build, uh, hopefully, a national land cover mapping uh, at the national scale using the Swiss Data Cube and machine uh, learning techniques. So first of all, the status of land cover in Switzerland. So the official data set that we have in Switzerland, it's called the Aeral Statistic in German. It's a, it's a data set that is produced based on visual interpretation of aerial photography every six years. And for, we have a 4 million grid points across the country where operators on a six year basis, they are assigned for each of these points, a land cover category and land use category, and also the official, what they call standard, uh, standard statistic at seven, 72 categories. So you have the numbers here uh, on the screen. Oh, yeah, it's super sensitive <laughs> but uh this um, despite the fact that this data set is really thematically rich uh, the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution impedes somehow to capture the detail of the landscape features qualities and particularities and the rapid changes across uh, across the country so we target for the moment, the test we've done, it's really on land cover. So this is the official classification that we have in Switzerland. So we have principal domains, six uh, classes, and then the basic categories at 20, uh, we have 27 classes. Our work so far has concentrated on the principal domain with the six uh, classes, but we are already expanding the work to the 27 uh, one. So just a, as a quick example, so this is a, an area you know, on the countryside of Geneva. So this, these are part of this point that you can see on the screen. So the, with a space of uh, 100 meter and then the translation in a land cover map. So you see that it's a coarse spatial resolution and it not well suited for, uh, for environmental monitoring. So we also assessed based on this data set recently, the land cover changes. So we realized that they are really small and spatially dispersed across the country, but quite dynamic. And uh, identifying the drivers and understand the rate of change across the country with this data set is really, uh, really limited. So we imagine that we can use now more advanced techniques uh, together with satellite data and uh, machine and deep learning techniques, we can improve uh, these uh, um, these uh, stages. 
And really the idea of, that we have with, within our team is to combine different data science techniques, obviously the data cubes, the machine learning algorithms and the HPC uh, infrastructure and develop new methodologies so that we can achieve the goal of having yearly medium to high resolution uh, a time series of land cover across the country. So, but there is a big issue also uh, related to that. And we realized when we did uh, our uh, literature review, it's the difference between the space first and the time first approaches. So usually it's, and commonly uh, you all know that we use space first approach. So we use, uh, we aggregate, time series, uh, data observation across a given time period, usually a year or something like this, so that we can reduce the volume of image collection and uh, overcome uh, data gaps. But now, thanks to the data cube technology, we can fully benefit also of the time dimension to capture the changes. So that's why Gilberto Camara, that is in the room, has also brought this idea of the time first approach. So really the idea is to classify time series separately and then join the results under, under the form of maps. So really the assumption, the basic assumption is that land cover classes of interest can be distinguished because of their temporal characteristics. And we'll take into account all the values in the time series and each special location is associated with the time series and we can track changes across the country. So as a use case, we tested over the greater Geneva area located here. This is a Sentinel-2 image. We used the Swiss data cube for providing access to, uh, to all the Sentinel-2 data that we have stored into the data cube. And we are using a tool that is called SITS. It's an R package that's, it's a wall-to-wall -wall, uh, framework for land cover classification connected to data cubes, generating those time series, training uh, machine learning and deep learning models, and then at the end, having a land cover maps. So basically, if we have seats at the core of the work, so we are gathering satellite uh, data directly from, uh, from the Swiss data cube. We ingest also uh, in the model, the, the points that I've shown before. Then we, we generate the time series also using NDVI and other indices. And then at the end, we cross-validate, we run the models, we classify, and then we, we have the accuracy model, and then we have hopefully the final map out of the out of the model. So we use as a use case uh, the, um, the year 2018 because that was the last uh, last data set that we have from the aerial statistic. We've seen the number of samples that we had uh, over the area. We trained different models. We tested random forest, temporal conv convolutional neural network, and also uh, the self-attention encoder, which is somehow the state of the art of, uh, of uh, deep learning models. And we obtain, uh, this, in this case, the patterns of the different time series for, according to the different classes. Then obviously, as you know, we have to improve the quality of the sample. So on, on the left side, we have before the quality assessment, assessment noise sample the, the, uh, detection and imbalance reduction. And then at the end of the process, we have good samples, let's say, to train the to train the model. And we obtain, obviously, probabilities for the different classes. So as a result, the same area I've shown before, the result before the aerial statistic, and the result we obtain now with a much better spatial resolution and detailed uh, area. So just a quick comparison with some transparency, the aerial statistic, and the result we obtain. So it's way more better. Uh, some results also regarding the cross-validation. As you see, they're, they're all, all the model tested, they are performing quite well uh, for the validation. But a key aspect is the uncertainty. So we computed also the uncertainty for the different models. So this is for the random forest. This is for the atten attention-based model and uh, the temporal CNN. And as you see, the deep learning models are, have less uncertainty compared to random forest. If we compare all the models also that we have tuned, temporal CNN is performing better in our case with a overall accuracy of 90%. And just to compare also with the space first approach using a median composite, you see that we achieve 82% classification. So the time first approach works pretty well. Uh, so initial conclusion, so the time first approach is performing better than the space, for, space first approach. Temporal CNN tuned in our case is performing better. 
deep learning met uh, methods have lower uncertainties. Good samples are essential. Hyperparameter tuning also is an essential task to perform. Uh, we achieve a higher spatial resolution. We detect more subtle details, higher accuracy, and we improve also the georeferencing of the of the of the map. So it's really an approach that is complementary to the official uh, official national statistics. And the next step is to improve the sampling strategy and the representativity of the samples, improve also the filtering and clustering. We want to add also contextual data, such, such as the DM in the model, add also new indices, so, such as the anthocyanin reflectance index that can help to distinguish between grassland and uh, shrubland. Compute also the uh, surface comparison between the official statistics and the, the new uh, land cover product. We are already testing the 20 several classes and it's also working quite well and test the different nomenclature that we have at the national scale and obviously also try it with Landsat data because it's the it's also key for the country. And then hopefully at the end, we'll come up with the national ta map time series across starting from 1984 up to the present days. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very, very much. And the next presentation will be given by Natalia Hoffman. Hello, everybody. I'm Natalia Kusul. Uh, I am from uh, National Technical University of Ukraine, Kyiv Polytechnic in, uh, Institute, and also I represent Space Research Institute, where I have been working for the uh, last 20 years. Our main expertise is satellite monitoring, especially machine learning on satellite data, deep learning, regarding land cover and land use, uh, land use change and geospatial intelligence. We have developed this methodology within uh, several uh, European uh, international projects, starting from Sigma and then uh, Aeroplanet and ISHE, and as well as uh, um, machine learning and especially deep learning technique requires uh, high uh, com performance computing. We implemented these technologies initially in uh, Amazon Web Services uh, within uh, Geo Amazon joint call. And right now, uh, we moved this technology to European cloud, to uh, CryoDS and now DIAS. Uh, and we are grateful for this uh, to uh, the initiative of Cloudfaro EO for UA. Uh, it is an initiative of synergizing uh, different uh, techniques and uh, um, products on the European cloud uh, for uh, Ukraine. And also we uh, run project uh, within open cloud for research environment, uh, OCRE for Ukraine, which is devoted to quantifying world damage in Ukraine based on Earth observation data in support for this initiative. So the main uh, applications which we are doing in the European context <laughs> is uh, the, our contribution to the project SWIFT, it is project of USPA, uh, to monitor European forests uh, regarding their diseases and uh, different kind of disasters such as wind throw and uh, uh, fires. Um, and uh, we develop high resolution uh, map of uh, forest types based on uh, uh, ESA world cover map, which doesn't have different kinds of forest and using uh, as a, a training set, Lucas Copernicus uh, data set. But main our expertise is uh, uh, focused on monitoring of Ukrainian land cover and agricultural landscape and 
we uh, deliver annually the uh, crop type maps for Ukrainian crops since 2017. And right now the crop map for this year for 2023 is ready. And the overall accuracy of this map uh, is uh, continuously um, higher than 90%, about 95%. And uh, uh, despite our abilities to collect in situ data for uh, our machine learning models is less right now due to war. We have uh, much uh, less uh, territory uh, to observe. Uh, according to our assessment of uh, land cover in Ukraine, we can say that now about 20% of cropland is under the occupation, and it is the most productive agricultural lands of Ukraine in the south and in the east of Ukraine. There are a lot of damages uh, uh, on the field, direct damages uh, caused by missiles, by uh, military vehicles, and uh, uh, here we can see the example of uh, fields which were damaged due to war and different color depict different time periods when it was bombed. And uh, right now we calculated the total uh, uh, damaged cropland and it is about one and a half million of hectares uh, along the front line of this war. And uh, while estimating the total cropland, we can see that uh, due to war, uh, the uh, total cropland uh, um, decreased last year for 10%, and all these red areas are the areas where the cropland's uh, area decreased. <laughs> And uh, uh, right now we have uh, this year comparing to 2021 when uh, there were no war in Ukraine, in total four and a half million of hectare uh, uh, of uncultivated uh, agricultural land, which were cultivated before the war and now it is uh, not used due to different factors. And yeah, and uh, where we use all this information, not just to uh, look at it and uh, frustrate, but uh, to use it uh, in our government, because right now Ukrainian statistical office, for example, has only 60% of their recipients and it cannot provide traditional methods of uh, statistics in Ukraine. And here in red, we can see the uh, oblasts. Uh, it is uh, not two areas uh, uh, which uh, where there is no statistical data and satellite observation is the only information about the situation there, about the problems, for example. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, international support uh, uh, programs for Ukraine. Uh, which provide uh, financial support to farmers who cannot uh, uh, use their land or uh, to farmers who uh, take uh, international support for uh, growing some crops. And it is very important to uh, monitor the efficiency of these uh, programs. And we use our data to understand if uh, the uh, this support to farmers was helpful was uh, um, caused the improvement of uh, the efficiency of agriculture and we can see that sometimes in 10 percent uh, uh, farmers who receives uh, funding for uh, growing crops uh, don't uh, cultivate their lands so uh, satellite monitoring become the uh, tool to monitor the efficiency and the, um, and help to manage these international uh, programs. Uh, 
Uh, all our results are presented in the GeoPortal, which was developed within a shape project. Now it is not open for public due to a military situation, but it is uh, it exists and it's uh, open for restricted use by Ukrainian government and by other uh, authorized partners. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalia. Now is the time for my presentation. It's coming. The first slide will be very nice. <laughs> Green strip on the top, I hope. Second one, it will be the list of project partners. <laughs> Third, it will be a classification diagram. The last one is with conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You have a PowerPoint version or no? Because it's it's a PDF that's making the problem. I was sure that PDF would be the best. No. Not this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. Good morning. Sorry for the little hiccup. Uh, formatting issue, of course, and we all know that about land cover issues. Um, I'm going to present a bit differently, so uh, I'm not sort of going into any projects, uh, but the title is Delivering on Land Cover Requirements for Policy Monitoring and Compliance. Um, as, as we've seen through all the other uh, presentations as well. Sorry, the clicker. I have the opposite problem. Is it this button? Scusa. Sì, non funziona. Thank you. 
Okay, I, I'll try and do these things by memory. Um, I don't have as many pretty pictures because actually the way I wanted to present this is to go into the discussion about all the different things that we've seen today about land cover, Eurogeo, and then how that can be pushed into, um, um, oh. Why do I think he's uh, uploading his uh, presentation? Okay, and I does the so. Okay, so I can keep talking. Um, okay, maybe instead of that, uh, we can take a couple of minutes for questions to the previous um, um, presenters. So maybe we'll start with that before then we get into the more general um, discussion on land use, land cover. So please go ahead. Anyone questions to the to the presenters? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question that is related to the compatibility of uh, the taxonomy used in different uh, uh, projects. Um, is it possible to think about uh, the translation from uh, uh, land cover taxonomy and the other one uh, also to have compatibility with uh, the Copernicus um, uh, products or other products? I don't know if this is, uh, I think this is an issue. Well, in, in Switzerland, the, the situation is quite clear because my colleagues from the WSL, so the, um, the Federal Office for um, Landscape Research, they have developed already a mapping between uh, the official land cover classification cl classification that we have for the country to, uh, and they map it to Corin. So we can translate easily then at the end also to, to the Corin, Corin land cover classes. So we have a, a direct mapping uh, between the two. Just to remind uh, um, that actually we discussed this topic uh, last year in Athens in our uh, uh, Eurogeo action group. And uh, if I remember well, the, 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 the conclusion was that indeed uh, there are many different taxonomies depending also on the use because uh, land cover in general is a transversal, uh, let's say, tool for, for many applications. And we suggested actually that one of the activities of the action group could be exactly try to work on that direction. Maybe we, if I remember well, we said that we could try to have a, a sort of general taxonomy and then have, let's say, community-based uh, uh, more detailed taxonomies for depending on the use. Uh, I would like to add a, a different perspective than Paolo and Greg, as I have said in many items, I think this is a lost cause. I think there is simply no way that you can name, I mean, especially in a global scale, which is part of this session, to a single taxonomy that would capture what is needed. Uh, in many cases, what we have seen in global maps, for example, the latest ESA map, which came out uh, last year, is that it's a map of land cover. And if one goes to the one example is the latest European Union uh, def regulation on deforestation free goods. If that regulation is to be implemented, uh, any there is to be a clear difference between what is the natural land cover and what is the human land cover. In other words, what has been the disturbance that humans made to the landscape. And for example, if you take the European maps, uh, the Google, Google maps, they do not make this distinction. They just land cover, doesn't tell what the land use is. So I am really, I mean, after uh, 45 years of experience, I can uh, really suggest to everyone involved, uh, this is a lost cause, concentrate on doing good maps because there will never be, a, there's, a, let's say, structural reasons why a unique and single taxonomy is impossible, in the same reason that a unique taxonomy of the language is impossible in the same way that a unique and an ambiguous translation is impossible. The roots are essentially the same. That's already turning into a hot 
I will try once again. May I ask for a presentation from PowerPoint? I hope it, that it was the really last copy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the title of my presentation is Land Cover Classification of uh, Poland Performed Every Year Based on Sentinel-2 uh, Satellite uh, uh, Images. At the beginning, short uh, information about ISA project, because uh, this classification approach was developed during uh, ISA project and uh, abbreviation of our classification is uh, like abbreviation of this uh, uh, project. So S to GLC, like Sentinel-2 Global Land uh, Cover. Uh, this uh, project was divided into two uh, phases. The phase one for developing uh, classification approach, uh, phase two, it was uh, extension and ISA proposed us uh, to classify the whole uh, Europe. Uh, project was led by us, it means for uh, uh, the leader was uh, Space Research, uh, Research Center of Polish Academy of Sciences, and we collaborate with uh, three uh, German uh, partners. The phase, uh, uh, the, the, the second phase was uh, leaded by us, and we collaborate only with uh, German company IABG, and uh, they were responsible for validation our work. Next one, please. Okay, here is a <clears throat> workflow of uh, our uh, classification approach. We don't have uh, time to follow our uh, steps, but what is the uh, most uh, important? For each uh, Sentinel-2 tile, tile, we collect uh, a set of uh, data and with each, uh, each uh, image is uh, classified uh, separately using uh, rand random forest. And it's very, very important uh, part that uh, the training is performed based of, on existing low resolution uh, databases. And having uh, a set of uh, results is uh, aggregation is, is, uh, is uh, performed and we have the final, oh, sorry. And we have the final, uh, result of classification of one uh, tile. Next is uh, post uh, processing, and we have we have uh, final uh, classification. It's very important that uh, all process is fully automatically. So it is classification without uh, without uh, uh, touching, and this uh, software was uh, prepared by. Uh, by us. During the project, we, we tested uh, this uh, classification approach and we classified the whole Germany, Italy, uh, a big piece of uh, Colombia, China, and also we had uh, study area located in, in Namibia. At, in, during the second uh, phase of this, pro uh, this project, we classify Isaac proposed uh, us uh, to classify uh, the Europe. Of course, we agree to do it, and our co computation were were performed using uh, Creodia's infrastructure. Altogether, we classify over fifteen thousand uh, images, and the final result was uh, validated using over fifty thousand. Uh, validation validation uh, pound, uh, points and we reach uh, in my opinion a really very good uh, uh, very good uh, result at the end of uh, this uh, project uh, Europe european commission and also isa they decided to use uh, uh, our map uh, during during uh, ministerial summit, it was uh, Geo Week uh, in uh, in Canberra. So our map was on on the front of uh, European uh, stand. And uh, shortly after after uh, the end of the project, uh, Polish uh, 
uh, Polish Space Agency, they did, decided to um, to use this uh, classification approach for uh, land uh, for preparing as uh, uh, land cover of uh, of uh, Poland, and since 2019 we produce nice set of of uh, land cover maps. So each year we we process uh, satellite uh, images uh, covered uh, our uh, our our country. Uh, in the table below, you see overall accuracy. If you know, it's uh, we are very close to ninety uh, uh, percent. But you know, in this moment, it's time to improve improve this uh, classification uh, approach uh, because uh, we have a lot of validation. Uh, this product is very well uh, validated, and in this moment, we know so what is really necessary to improve and uh, i i'm sure that uh, next year we will reach uh, really very good uh, results very close to uh, 90 percent uh, and uh, please remember that this classification works is classification without any manual touching so it's fully automatic uh, uh, process and here just at the end, some examples uh, of uh, our classification. So it's a construction of uh, of an express uh, way. In 2090, it's impossible. To, we don't see this uh, the, this uh, uh, cons construction. But in 20, it's a strip of uh, gray gray strip. It means that it's a class Bayer soil. And uh, next in 21, it's possible to, to recognize uh, some pixels which were uh, um, classified as uh, artificial. At uh, after four years, uh, we have the, this express uh, road uh, is is uh, finished. We have class artificial. Other example is uh, digging the Vistula split is very easy to recognize the progress of this of this uh, of this uh, work. And uh, the, this uh, uh, this example it was uh, for for me it was a, a really a surprise because uh, I noticed that uh, in year twenty twenty one are some circle on the center of Szczecin Reservoir. Uh, and I was really surprised. First, my impression it was that is something wrong with our classification uh, approach. But uh, I found in information that uh, the, the government, they started to build artificial uh, island uh, island. So maybe it's something like the beginning of our local Alcatraz. And uh, having this nice uh, set of land cover um, uh, cl classification, we started uh, we started with uh, change detection, and in this moment we have a methodology which is dedicated to our uh, land cover uh, uh, classification. And uh, this uh, approach will be uh, will be it will be a part of land cover uh, map. I think uh, next uh, next year. And conclusion, the results of uh, our ISA project are put uh, to practical use. Uh, uh, we are very happy that we have a possibility to classify Poland uh, every every year and change the detection of land cover will, will be implemented in the uh, coming year. Many thanks for your attention. And sorry for these uh, problems with uh, PDF uh, file. Really, I was surprised of that. Thank you. Almost there. So uh, I'm back again. No, <laughs> shaking his head. That's not good. Um, uh, just to sort of uh, fill in um, uh, so that I don't have to repeat it after, but the, the discussion that we will be having, um, and, and I, I'm going to be trying to sort of promote it, is 
as, as you can see, there's a, uh, and you notice, there's a wide variety of land cover products through different projects for different reasons, both uh, government, uh, non-government. Eurogeo in general is, of course, then trying to see how we can take advantage of that at the policy level. And of course, if we can take advantage of it at the policy level here, then we can scale it up to global and, and demonstrate some of our uh, technologies and, and solutions for um, uh, within GEO. Um, so your, your question about the land cover classification is valid. Um, there's quite a number of things that definitely we will be discussing. And also please remember that the things you will be saying today we will be trying to push up. So there will be a report coming out. Uh, we will tomorrow, sort of the, the high level uh, messages will also be presented. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so I'm Conrad Bielski, EO Explorer. Um, and uh, as I started saying, so uh, a lot of the work that we are doing is is for a reason. Uh, the, the big reason right now is the EU Green Deal. Uh, as you very well know, there's uh, there's very different themes involved, uh, and the hope is that we can use the information, so geospatial information that either comes from Earth observation or other, in order to support that uh, circular economy, decarbonization, digitalization. Of course, all the data we work with is is digital. Um, so again. Uh, if we have access to other data sets that can be linked with what we're doing also would be helpful. And of course, we've seen some of the other themes uh, within Eurogeo, which is uh, biodiversity uh, and et cetera. Um, we've been talking a lot about validation, uh, setting appropriate targets. We as the producers can think about what kind of targets we have to think about but we also need to provide that kind of information to the policymakers so that they don't think that we can deliver everything. Um, so again, I'm, I'm using a very useful statistical uh, you know, uh, figure about accuracy and precision. So which is more important? Uh, for which policies uh, can they be uh, integrated with? Um, are these kinds of details within the policy and then can it be moved over to the, the type of work that we're doing? Uh, you can also switch the accuracy and precision with space and time. Uh, we know satellites aren't always looking. Uh, we have other technologies that maybe can be used in tandem with that. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that um, we should be thinking about, not just as a land use, uh, land cover sort of uh, community, but working together for the goals of policy monitoring. And, and what is that? Uh, I mean, implementation progress. Uh, we've seen we need inputs for that. We have to we have to see the outputs. We need to be able to uh, uh, understand what's going on and then hopefully take that understanding and build on that. Uh, so again, you know, policy is, is something that is going to be changing. Uh, it's uh, the current Green Deal. I mean, that's on a long-term horizon. So we do have these chances to use our experiences up to now and then develop new ones as, as uh, the, the policy matures, let's say. Um, and the quality of reporting is very important. Uh, we're seeing you know, what's done in different countries. Can the different countries come up with certain their own solutions or should we be looking for something more pan-European or as, as even mentioned, global. Um, that's, that's always a big question in these cases. Um, and and that's, gonna, that's gonna affect the design of how we go about. Uh, we've seen different products uh, and, and different people put different, um, um, how do you say, in, um, importance to you know, how quickly the data is, uh, maybe more classes, but less uh, precise or accurate. So all these things are, are very valuable to discuss in, uh, in this context. The next one is policy compliance. I mean, that's, that's the next level because it's one thing to monitor uh, and, and sort of tell somebody, hey, you know, we noticed uh, this is happening, this is occurring. But if we really want to change and we really want to move forward, we have to be able to demonstrate quantitatively uh, even pushing to the court of law. Uh, and, and again, these are in many cases information that is not normally used. 
So it can't be expert. It, uh, we should be able to uh, explain this to a non-expert in terms of you know, uh, land cover, earth observation. Um, and, and that's really our job. Uh, I mean, we're, we're starting to showcase a lot of these solutions uh, and hopefully we're gonna be getting our message to the, to the right people. Because if they can see that, yes, that's, uh, that's available as a tool, then hopefully we can also make uh, policy actions like the Green Deal uh, a reality. Which then comes back to what is land cover? I know I'm I'm talking to the uh, sort of uh, community, but but that's a real question. We we are always looking at the technologies. We we somehow get into our niches, uh, but we do have to every so often look outside the box uh, and see what those needs are and, and talk to people who maybe don't understand what we're doing. Um, you know the <laughs> the big question came about the land cover classifications. Um, you know, is it, is it sort of um, easier for the user just to decide what is important to them? Uh, should we be getting the, the input from somewhere else and then letting them know how well we can, uh, we can do it? Uh, quality over quantity. Uh, we have techniques right now that can very easily produce uh, maps and, and land cover. So, but, but do we know whether that's applicable in, in the policy context? Uh, so I go, I sort of digress definitions, uh, making sure that what we're talking about is well understood by the other parties who may not be the experts. Uh, and of course, continuity. These policies will be moving for quite a few years in the future. We need to look back even on what's going on. Uh, and that's going to affect, of course, how we develop these uh, land cover, land intelligence services. Um, so uh, as I said, the, the main discussion that we, we should be having here as, uh, as Eurogeo is, um, you know, if we can do it in Europe, then it, we can do it anywhere. Uh, but again, we know the European perspective, we know how difficult that is, uh, but we still should be able to, to, to showcase that. Um, and, and hopefully some of those showcases will come out in the discussions and, and we, pu we can push those uh, forward. Uh, and, European policy, of course, is, is linked to other global initiatives. We've seen the SDGs presented today. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the land, our land cover group, I mean, it's, it's a, let's, let's say the, the lowest common denominator. Uh, and we should be supporting the cross-cutting activities. So not just looking at the usual sort of environmental policies, but maybe linking them up with also other types of um, uh, policies that can integrate geospatial data with maybe some other non-geospatial data. So that's where I, I finish my slide. Um, and then now I would really encourage to continue those uh, the discussions. Um, and of course, our session is called Scaling European Land Cover, uh, Land Intelligence uh, to the World. Um, and this is sort of the kinds of things we already started talking about. Uh, and I'll just leave, a, or I'll start with this slide. Because these are the types of questions and discussions. Uh, if you have, if you're not part of the group yet, then please come up to us after and give us your contact. Uh, but these are the things we're trying to internally discuss. Hopefully, come up with a nice answer and then push forward uh, through Eurogeo and beyond. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, so uh, please, if there's any, I don't know if there's any questions online for any of the uh, presenters, or we can also jump in directly to the discussion topics. Uh, because I said, as I said, anything and everything you say here will be used in a GRC report. Um, so uh, it's, it's, you know, it's about telling the wider community, maybe what are the issues, um, maybe you have some solutions that, that are working, uh, and how should we move forward with that? Yeah, maybe just a, a, a quick uh, a quick thought or also about we are talking about Eurogeo, which is obviously the, the, the topic of the, of the week. But I, I would say in my case, for example, uh, in what I've shown before, it's already beyond Euro Europe because I'm benefiting with my team 
to the work done by the Brazil Data Cube team and, and Gilberto's team uh, developing the, the seed solution. So it's already broader and it's already connecting, I would say, at the global level. So I think that's we have been we will prob probably bring some European solutions, but we will also benefit from other countries. And I think that's the raison d'être, huh, we say in French, uh, of geo. So I think that's uh, that's a really, a really valuable point that we, we have to keep in mind, I guess. And so that was your initiative or through geo in particular? Well, that, that was definitely through, through geo, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other like that? No, I wanted to say something else. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, just just some comments. I mean, it's minor, but I think it's really important to understand that we are not only focusing on land cover, but this initial title it implies that our main focus will be land cover. But I think we should really move to whatever land use so land use should really become more of a priority because i fully agree with what gilberto said you know we need to move to the land use uh, component more do we need to move more to this kind of land cover characteristics so to the temporal components as well and maybe it should be reflected somehow or we could just call it land intelligence action group right so i mean just some, I, I don't have the full solution. I know you want to just demonstrate there is some kind of land cover initial starting point. But anyway, another point. Um, so you had this bullet point on what we can do in Europe, we can do anywhere, right? So I think it's partly correct. So if it applies to AI and algorithms, you can transfer them easily to other places. But it's not true for available training data. So again, we need, there's a bit of this confusion around reference data. The US people actually, they only use reference data for validation. It's, we need some more, more clarity on some of these terms, but in Europe we use reference data for, for many things, also for topographic maps and stuff. Anyway, that's a minor other point, but the problem is really the, the, the training data and the in situ and the reference data, so whatever we call it, there's a big gap in, in developing countries. There's massive gaps, and we've seen that in many projects. There was very little data in Africa. Uh, it, it really, really hard to map anything because you have no training. And without training, as we know, we're not getting good maps. So I think we need to think about that, right? I mean, I mean you have this, you know, underpinning the role of institute measurements, but do we want to really do something to to close these data gaps so that that's a bit of question to do really globally really good good mapping you, you need more more good reference data especially when you go to the land use if the land cover you can visually derive from very high risk but if you want to go to the land use part you need much more information on on that thanks yeah yes please so since you said that if you can do in Europe, you can do anywhere in the globe. Let me talk about the, let me be talk on behalf of the rest, okay, of the world. As some of you may know, I was director of the Geo Secretariat for three years and now back to Brazil. I mean, let's first reflect. I think it's very important from an outsider's perspective and what Europe has done uh, very positively. And I think without any shadow of a doubt, uh, the Copernicus program satellite has been a major game changer and absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic contribution of Europe, including the guarantee of open data and the guarantee of continuity. So if Europe would do nothing else, the maintenance of the Copernicus program would justify the claim that Europe is doing a fantastic job for the world. Now, the issues regarding land use and land cover, I think, of course, it's very easy. I mean, someone who has been like me around the globe to underestimate what is different elsewhere. Uh, assumptions that we make about what people have and how people use the land are very unlikely to, to meet the test of reality. It's, of course, very good 
that we can have cooperations like we have, for example, in Brazil with the Swiss Data Cube, with, with Yaza for a long time, with the Open Geo Hub, which is here. And I think that's the way forward. Uh, I don't really think that a single, let's say, European based solution can scale up to the world. I, I, I have yet to see a case where that is true. That is, of course, not in any way uh, distinguishing, reducing European uh, contribution, which is fantastic in Copernicus. But I think you also, many of the projects underestimate uh, strongly, how long does it take to develop capabilities in anywhere? And uh, sometimes we forget how long did it took to get to, to where the point where Natalia is in Ukraine? I know Natalia for many more years than we would admit here in the gentleman's conversation, but I know that this has been a long, long work in Ukraine to reach the point that Natalia has come up with uh, key statistics. So I think that this is a long shot, and I don't think the solution or the solution, of course, developing tools, making them available. This is fantastic. Now, a final point. The new system, which is the no, uh, allow me to call it the new DS, is, will be the proof of the pudding from the blend point of elsewhere. Currently, I cannot use DS, but I can use Amazon and I can use Microsoft Planetary Computing and I can make my software run on, on, on Swiss Data Cube. But for example, there is no way, even if I, I, and I, I make my software run on Digital Earth Africa and NASA HLS, but there is no current uh, place where you say you want to contribute without asking any cent from Europe a software that will run on the new DS. This is possibility is somehow unthinkable for Europe. So please write it down that the new DS should welcome the possibility of uh, external contributors which are willing to share what they have and in some ways uh, pay their tribute in the good sense of the word to the European contribution to, to the global, which has been the Copernicus program. Uh, and we are very much open to the new friends Okay, it's work. But then just comment to the last point. I think uh, since July on CDSC, there's also now OpenEO as a backend. I mean, the CDSC is also now a backend of OpenEO which comes with free credits. Um, okay, if you really want to start using it uh, for services. That's my question. I, I have a contribution. My question is following, it's simple. I have a contribution, which as you saw today, was considered to be valid for Swiss Data Cube. I would like to make that contribution available without asking any penny, any euro, at this this new CDSS, how can I do it? What do you mean as contribution? Code or data? My software runs on Digital Earth Africa. How can my software run on the CDSS? A simple question to ask. I run in a planetary computer. I run on my Amazon. How can my software run? I run it on SIPO. How can my software run on CDSS? simple i mean i want to contribute no i think you can just make an open your workflow and no i don't want to make an open your i have a, a running software tested that is used to classify amazonia which is an area bigger than europe i want to contribute that software to cdss i'm also by the way making our software run as a back end to open your but that's a side story i'm saying that how because you talked about my, my point here is put your money where your mouth is if you talk about world cooperation and you simply want someone from the world, which exists, you know, by the way, there are people outside the Europe. And then you want to simply say, I want to use, have my software running 
uh, software which is completely tested and validated and without asking you any money for it and to full, fully documented, I just want it to run on CDSS and make it available to whoever wants to use it. How can I do it? Yeah, as far as I know, I'm I'm no expert on that, but I think you can just make the Docker files available and people can just start up the virtual machines on CDSE, which is open telecom backend and Cloud Faro. Yeah, yeah, just just briefly, I'm I'm also not an expert, but but a few things I, I think I understood. And of course, the question is: Do you want to run it for yourself, or do you want others to use it? That that's that's already that's already a, a big difference. If you just want to run it for yourself, you open an account, you check whether the platform fulfills all the requirements that your software uh, uh, needs in terms of of an environment, and whether the data are there, and whatever you want to you want to use, and then. You have to see whether within the quota that you get for free, you can what you can do, and if not, you will have to pay, like you pay on Amazon and, and other platforms as well. And then I think you can start. If, of course, you want to advertise it as a service for free or 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 also for money, then then it becomes a bit more complicated. But in principle, also this should be possible. So it's in in that sense, it's a cloud platform like like any other as well, like planetary computer or like Amazon. Yeah, that's that's regarding uh, evil lands. But actually, I think Stefan uh, this afternoon he has a, a, a session, and I think the in situ session there's a, a specific uh, presentation on the the in situ component of 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 evil land. Uh, but what what I what I just want to say on on that is actually that um, in indeed having open training data available is is important. Um, and I see now that really also the commissioning the commission is pushing also the service provider to make the the data available. So it's uh, there's already quite some useful data sets there existing, but much more is coming up. Sure, that, that, that would be possible, yeah. I mean, that's some of the data sets, like I said, are already available on platforms like Zenodo or, or other uh, repositories. Um, yeah, as long that as they are cited in the, uh, according to the licensing, it's that's fine. Maybe just one point I want to make a little bit also on this validation aspect here. I mean, see, everybody is reporting over accuracy figures, right? And I'm a bit, yeah, personally, I'm I'm not big, the biggest fan of it because it doesn't say actually what's behind. Uh, yeah? There's so much ways of how to report accuracy. As you know, it all depends on the sampling design, response design, um, and 
just stating overall accuracy is it's it's yeah i think that it, it it would need at least also the way how the validation was done was it done independently was it done by cross validation uh i think that, that, that that's important because often users look just to overall accuracies uh, and say okay this map looks better but maybe it has only five classes while another map has 15 classes it has a different sampling design it's not global it's it's regional this this kind of reporting i think it's 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 important to 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 provide a bit more context at least how the the validation was done um and well there are some standards on validation protocols but it's uh, it's not yet that common practice that that people report according to this uh, these protocols so uh I think I think that's important and also for the user base to have a uh, a clear understanding how the validation has, has been done. Uh, Conrad, um, I wanted to say something. If you if is it time, yeah, um, we uh, we we did a land cover mapping space time for Europe, thirty meter, and we discovered that it's way more interesting to make these fraction maps right and to predict for every class probability and because it's way more usable you can do many it's more flexible you can do many things you can merge classes you can set different thresholds etc and we came up to log loss as the accuracy measure actually log loss so log loss yeah it's called log loss and you can estimate the log loss log log like a logarithmic logarithmic loss it's kind of um that's the measure for the probability space right um and then we discovered there's no really there's no documentation there's you know in statistics but for the land cover there's no standards and stuff and um and so that's something we'll be interested if somebody has experience please share uh with the probability mapping and the second thing i want to say i sent an email just uh five minutes ago uh we started putting all these legends you know everything we find uh in this category we started putting it so we just have it at one place so we made a google sheet and uh so i i have i think about 40 tables now like biomes corine cropscapes uh, lucas uh, global ecosystem legend then there's also global impact pressure change classes global change impacts uh, global change pressures so we started putting all these things and if somebody thinks we miss some important legend please let us know uh, we'll make these legends available in a software so you can just load the software and you can just say hey, i need a corina legend uh, some version i don't know and you can just load it and work with it so you don't have to enter it manually uh, that's one of the main things we do in open net monitor we want to speed up um, you know people doing spatial modeling and accessing data and using data for uh, applications so please if you if you're on this mailing list that conrad made I send a Google sheet, and if you think we forgot something, please send us, we'll integrate it, and we will make it available one more time in a software so you can load it very easily. You you just load it by some code or something, and poof, off you go, Euro crops and things like this. Thank you. I, I have just a short comment. Uh, Stefan uh, noticed that we changed a little uh, the name of our uh, action uh, group before it was land cover and uh, land use. Now it's land cover, land intelligence. We, we talk a lot with uh, Conrad uh, about what what is the role of this uh, of this uh, group, and also we notice that, uh, for example, uh, action group uh, biodiversity they are using land cover, so we can say our land cover is used by them the same green deal also the the main part of this uh, uh, work is uh, is uh, land uh, land cover and uh, land use so we decided to change uh, to change the name so it's uh, and we think that is a good solution that land cover land intelligence uh, because uh, we should be more open for new uh, new uh, technology new uh, new ideas so it will be not only land cover but also change uh, detection the use of uh, uh, new uh, new technology algorithms and also also uh, technology 
I'm still thinking about uh, quantum uh, computers because uh, because I'm sure that in two years it will be not not standard, but in this moment is something that we're talking about it. Uh, but uh, in two years uh, we will see the first uh, first uh, results of 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 uh, this completely different uh, classification uh, approach how to manage uh, manage uh, uh, data and the people who are uh, working with quantum they are they they are using satellite images because it's a fantastic set of uh, of uh, of data and it's a situation that uh, it's difficult uh, for us it's difficult to help them they don't need our help in this on this uh, stage of of development of this uh, this technique but we should be very close to this because uh, we're thinking how to continue the high level of uh, our uh, our uh, products so i think that this uh, land intelligence you know is is more it's 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 fine. It's, it's better <laughs> better name of our group. I this have. <laughs> may I? Um, uh, first, I have a suggestion uh, with respect to the access or to new reference data. The suggestion is we have within uh, Geo uh, the e letter network, the ecological long term networks of sites. We have also within Europe, uh, in this case. Uh, the network of Natura 2000's protected areas. Their data, for definition, should be collected regularly in order to monitor biodiversity, ecosystem states, and so on. Uh, so why do not take as a new reference data sets uh, specific points where measurements are regularly collected within the ecological long-term network system, the Natura 2000 networks. And this is just a suggestion uh, that um, uh, um, taking again uh, the issues related to taxonomies and the translation between taxonomies, I would like to remind the huge work done by FAO, um, uh, uh, which are which is trying now to develop ontologies related to the description of land cover classes in order to move to land use classes. Uh, within EcoPotential, just to mention one recent uh, close project, uh, we developed the, the EODESM uh, system, uh, which is based on um, uh, the FAOL CCS uh, taxonomy and which uh, developed a uh, possible uh, translation map between uh, taxonomies. The problem is not only in uh, the name, in the label. <laughs> the problem is in uh, the ontology of the classes. Otherwise, it is impossible, according uh, to my <laughs> small experience, uh, to deal with the changes. And the issue of uh, taxonomies and translation, I agree with the camera that it's not possible to solve uh, the world uh, land cover mapping with one taxonomy, for sure. But we need to focus on the ontology. So otherwise, it, is, it will be difficult uh, to answer to issues from the ecological community uh, or from the geology community Many communities ask us land cover, land cover changes, and land use. The last <laughs> is related to quality assessment. Uh, I agree, uh, we need to know errors, um, uh, uncertainties. Uh, so probably we need to agree uh, at global level on uh, specific uh, measurements that should be uh, applied at the end of the production of uh, an output uh, link over and use map and the change map. We need uh, to recognize uh, these um, common measurements to identify first and then recognize and use.
maybe collecting collecting uh, reference data is uh, really very complex uh, complex uh, subject and we should try to combine existing uh, data databases and uh, how to do it is really <laughs> it's not so uh, easy and uh, why we uh, found that is a real uh, problem of uh, land cover uh, classification in for example our we produce uh, land cover of poland computation is uh, two or three weeks it depends if we using one computer or two next some weeks for uh, validation and uh, we need data which are accurate and uh, and updated every year so it's impossible to find this uh, data and we uh, we perform visual visual interpretation. It took some weeks or months, a lot of uh, a lot of work. Of course, we have a nice uh, data data set, and uh, it would be fine to have a place where it's possible to to move it and to to make this uh, the, our data open for for uh, for uh, for other and maybe will be possible to 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 use uh, other data but uh, you know we have just an idea that is really necessary but how to arrange it just like that yeah, I'm not sure with but I, I agree with your point. Um, I, I didn't know about the Natura 2000, but the, the problem is even as you as an expert, I mean, you're an expert in your domain and you know where the data is, but we are now talking about Green Deal, let's say. So we're way up there. Different um, actors, and they would also like to have access to that. And, and so I agree with you that if we can start bringing those things together in a standard way, in a you know well documented, uh, then it could become more useful to more people. Yes, just to put my let's say technical perspective. I've been a, I'm not a thematic expert here. Um, I'm a technical. Um, well, I, I've I'm hearing you talking about difficulties in translating. Um, terms and classifications. So what about the use of online vocabularies for ontologies? Some like, for example, show book, or I mean, for sharing online these ontologies, these are machine readable. So if I am uh, using uh, machine learning or something like that, I can have access to these descriptions online. I can see the labels, I can put everything together. And uh, this is something, for example, in, if my description contains that this term is same as, is uh, um, sibling to another. So this would be a good way forward, for example. Uh, this is something that uh, is being done at European level. For example, the Eurovoc is made available through Shavok. And this is something, for example, that Switzerland is, is doing, uh, is trying to do now. Uh, um, and, and in my view, this could be a good way. And also regarding the description, possibility to learn, for example, validation procedures and so on. This could be done, for example, extending current metadata standards. What we are doing, for example, uh, we are extending stack, which is very well known, but this can be done for DCAT AP or GeoDCAT AP, um, which will be used, for example, for high value data set in Europe and contribution to the Green Deal data space. So why not uh, contribute all together? For example, we are extending stack through uh, machine learning uh, needs. Okay, um, and also for analysis and processing needs. So could, this could be a good way to cooperate together because this is a cross-cutting issue. It's not typical to land cover or land uh, intelligence, how you call it. So, and also linking data set together. This is what we're trying to do with Switzerland, for example. Uh, 
um, linking the data set together. So let's say this reference data is linked to this other reference data. And this could be done through ontologies and online vocabularies. So this is just my two cents. Okay, great two cents. Um, we're running out of time. So uh, last comments and, uh, and then we'll finish up. Go ahead. Ma Maybe just one one quick uh, question to what you mentioned on the permanent networks. I I know that at some point, maybe some years ago, Elta Elta was not publicly available. Has this changed now? Because Elta, as far as I know, is not an open open data set. But maybe it has changed. I would be happy to learn that. It is a suggestion. The policy are not made by me. I think. We could suggest, and uh, there is a big project, Yelter project, founded by the European Commission. Uh, so it is possible to interact with uh, the PI and ask to provide, uh, according to specific requirements, uh, some reference data, because for sure they need uh, link over land use and mainly information about the changes. So it is a time to, to put together the results of different projects. And other things, uh, we could also provide a reference data set made by no change reference data. Uh, we have automatic, uh, I mean, people working on link over and use know how to detect no change target. We could start to, a fair a big reference data set made by no change target. The target class still is there. So this could be used as additional reference data. We can start just using uh, a small set of uh, land cover classes. So it's important to, to start this process. Yes, because altogether is a very complex uh, subject. No, no, but I'm I'm glad with the points that were made. Any any final sort of uh, suggestions before we finish up? Ah, go ahead. I, I want just to add something on Alter because I'm personally involved into the process of building the research infrastructure uh, on top of the network existing network. So we are we are uh, we are on the way. So we have no not yet an available a pub, publicly available database of all the uh, data sets that are uh, that belongs to the elder community and this is true but uh, there is also an ongoing process because uh, uh, elder is trying also to candidate to candidate itself to be uh, a reference for calibration and validation of uh, uh, satellite products and uh, this is something that we just started and we are in we started an interaction with ESA to understand and also we are trying to to realize some uh, demo for for certain kind of products and of course we have to uh, work together to understand which kind, uh, because we are defining now our standard observation. That means that once we have the list of the observation that we are committing ourselves to, to, to take on a regular basis, so you will have all the information of the, about the frequency, the kind of protocol that has been used for those me measurement, if they are by sensor, if they are not, if they are observation in the field, uh, and also all that would be available with metadata, metadata, with standards, so that it would be easier at a certain point to link the needings of uh, of the remote sensing community and the needs of the people collecting the data in the field. So we have to start now interact uh, more on that to, to, to build something common. Just to complement as well, here at working at the EA, we, we have been having a few meetings with the elder community uh, to, to try to assess exactly what is needed also from the CLMS point of view. And we are trying to establish this dialogue with with Elter in order to make sure we we collaborate together as well. So yeah. Okay. 
Thanks everyone for being here. Um, those uh, who offered, uh, I might come up to you actually because I need your names and contacts. Uh, but uh, we'll try to give a sort of couple lines tonight so that uh, because tomorrow during the plenary, some of the issues and discussions we've had here will go public. Uh, but then as a group, hey, we're going to continue uh, looking into these issues. I mean, uh, it's great to have new people on board because, hey, you might have the solution we've been looking for. So thanks, everyone, for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your adieu.